Welcome to another episode of Meet the GPP. Today we have Nai Vassal joining us. Can you please tell us a bit about your educational background and current work affiliation? I've been working as a postdoc slash research associate uh, on the GPP project. And I've been working with one of the principal investigators of the GPP, Dr. Clark Barrett at the anthropology department at UCLA. I'm a cognitive developmental psychologist by training. Um, and I'm an, also an assistant professor at the psychology department at California State University, East Bay. And I'm also a research affiliate at UC Berkeley where um, I'm lucky to be part of several collaborations that continued from my time as a postdoc there. Before graduate training in psychology with Dr. Coley at Northeastern, I studied linguistics and cross-cultural communication at the Krasnodar State University in Russia, or to be more specific, in Siberia, where I'm from. Can you tell me about your research interests? So in general, uh, I'm interested in how people reason about complex systems, and that includes biological, physical, and social systems. In that line of work, I study how people reason about agents uh, embedded in complex social structures and how these uh, agents' properties and capacities to perform different actions vary depending on the, the local context, their position within the structure. So depending on where you are, maybe in certain social hierarchy, you might have different characteristics, uh, you might have different uh, affordances for action. And I'm examining how people reason about other agents who are who occupy different positions within social structure. What is your involvement with the GPP? So as I said, I've been working with uh, Clark Barrett at UCLA, um, who's, been, who's been an amazing and supportive mentor. And I learned and continue learning a lot from him and in general from being on the GPP team, interacting with other PIs, uh, Edward Mashery and Stephen Stitch, and with many wonderful postdocs and students and just other collaborators working on the project. Joining the GPP was kind of a strange experience because I started basically at the same time as the pandemic hit us all in the face. So many things we were hoping and planning to do did not happen. Um, on the other hand, other things did happen. We realized that an unfolding pandemic is a very unique situation when both communities and individuals um, have to process a lot of new information. And a lot of this information is literally about life and death issues. So the first project I got involved in looked at how people process information about the pandemic and how different factors such as the source of the information, basically whether it's coming from a medical professional or political leader or religious leader, or is just posted on the social media or you don't even know where it's coming from how that influences to what extent a person is going to believe that piece of information. And we examined also how the content of the claim, well, whether it's actually true or false, and whether it provides you with guidance on how to act or not, how all that influences people's trust in information about the pandemic. We relied on a large body of other work that shows that people easily fall for fake news and misinformation in general. We thought people were going to be pretty bad at figuring out what to trust about the pandemic. We actually found the opposite. So across the board, we found that people are pretty good at sorting false, uh, true claims from false claims. Uh, they trusted medical professionals more than other sources. And they were particularly good at, it, at identifying true prescriptions, so the guidelines on how to act in order to survive, which if you think about it, that's kind of the most important information you want to pick out of, of all the radio chatter. Another project that I'm very excited about is called Choice Architecture. It examines when and why we blame others for bad choices in context when all they had were bad options. For the first study with COVID and misinformation, what are the populations you were working with? So we, we were working with um, people in, from six countries, the US, Spain, and Ecuador, those were the uh, high pandemic severity countries. And we had Germany, Sweden, and New Zealand. Those were the low pandemic severity countries. All of these uh, people were recruited and tested online um, through Qualtrics panels. Can you describe the importance of cross-cultural research? 
um, as, as someone who's not originally from the U.S. and had this personal experience of coming to the U.S. and saying, wow, what an odd culture, how people do things very weirdly here. Um, the idea that like you could just study um, weird populations that is uh, Western educated, rich industrialized democratic societies and take that as a benchmark for how people, people's psychology in general, uh, that just seems a little, a little odd. Though I don't know if that, that's just my personal <laughs> sense of how and why cross-cultural research is important. Some things about cross-cultural research are not as straightforward as I thought. So kind of going into, um, jo when I joined this project, I just had this maybe starry-eyed idea of cross-cultural research, like, oh, this is, this is so important and we just need to study as many populations as possible. And I realized that you know, some of my assumptions were actually not quite on the right track. Um, and some assumptions about why we do cross-cultural research, what we can and cannot learn from it. And that, you know, we sometimes get excited about it for the wrong reasons. Why do, do we find these studies so exciting? Um, is it because researchers treat these small scale communities as windows into some frozen past snapshot as if these groups did not have their own history, they were not in contact with any other communities, uh, they're completely unaffected by the larger economic and governmental policies of their region. Like it's tempting to make such assumptions because they make for juicy interpretation of the results. You know, here is how the modern humans com compare to the humans before civilization in some way, but that's often not justified. So there is this tension. How do we look beyond these weird populations without caricaturizing everyone else? and treating them merely as some sort of exotic backdrop that you know, just provides a nice catchy contrast in our studies of some more general human psychology. Um, so Clark Barrett has a new paper coming out that goes over these tensions much more eloquently. Uh, and I'm just left kind of scratching my head and, and thinking, yeah, some of my assumptions were raw. Thank you, Nye. Want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to chat and just want to express my general gratitude and appreciation for being on the GPP project and establishing these new connections and learning from very bright people.